He is risen. Christ's resurrection is a real fact, and that real fact affects, of course, life today. The two of them had hurried as fast as they could. With a seven-mile trip by foot, they had run, got out of breath, and they would walk fast, and then they would run again. They had walked a a more leisurely pace before on the seven-mile trip back to their home. But now, things were much different. They were in a big hurry. Had they left their cell phones behind, as some of us do from time to time? No, this was way before the time of cell phones. They were in a truly a big hurry. But what's so important Well, when they got there, the doors of the place they wanted to get to were locked. They could tell people were inside, and they pounded on the doors, and they identified themselves. Then the doors were open. And the first words out of their mouth was, it is true, it is true, he has risen. I think you know what this account is about. It's about those people, two people, who had left at Easter afternoon, going from Jerusalem back to their home in Emmaus. And on their way, they're discussing some things which were confusing. For some of the women folk had said that Jesus had risen. But it didn't seem to make sense to them. But then along the way, a stranger joined them. Actually, it was Jesus, but he didn't allow them to recognize him. And he showed from the scriptures that the Christ had to suffer and die and rise again. Then as they ate together, Jesus allowed himself to be recognized, and then he disappeared. They were so excited. They had to run back and tell the disciples this great news. It was a real fact. Jesus had risen. The disciples then also had a hard time believing this. My mother once told us children, don't believe everything you hear. She was referring especially in our grade school days where we would hear this about that person, about this person, and most of the time it was not true anyhow. And that was good advice. Well, the disciples did not believe everything they heard, but they should have, because Jesus himself had said he would rise from the dead. And then suddenly, although the doors were locked, Jesus appeared to them. And they couldn't believe what they were seeing. And Jesus said, come, touch me. And then they all called for some food. As they ate the food, of course, the food disappeared. And they did believe that Jesus had risen. His resurrection, a fact of life. And we note that the disciples had not been uh, believing very quickly. And we think of Doubting Thomas. All have been slow to believe. But actually, there is a silver lining in this dark cloud. That these skeptical disciples ended up being fully convinced that Christ had risen. Certainly underlines the truth that he did rise in the grave. And actually, great news. And the apostles would devote the rest of their lives to spreading the message of Christ's sufferings, death, and resurrection, that through him our sins are forgiven. You know, there also are times we might doubt that word of God. For example, you ever worry? Are you not doubting that God will take care of you? 
and he makes all things work together for your good. The resurrection, a fact of life. In the very first sentence of the Apostle John's letter, we have these words from John. Almost, you can feel the excitement. He says, we have heard him, we have touched him, we have observed him. And then three times in this first four verses of John, he says, we have seen him. Of course, John had been with Jesus for about three and a half years during Jesus' ministry. He saw miracles of Jesus, feeding of the 5,000, raising people from the dead. He heard Jesus preach and teach. Then after the resurrection, Jesus had been with them and appeared to them numerous times. There was a time when Jesus appeared to over 500 people. The resurrection of Jesus, a real fact. And that fact, of course, affects our life. You know what the resurrection means for us today? Many, many things. For one thing, our sins are forgiven. One thing, another thing, Christ keeps his word. And John speaks about two things uh, in this epistle, in these first four verses. He speaks about that through Christ, we now have a fellowship with God. Isn't that amazing that through faith, we have a fellowship with the Almighty. Many of you tomorrow will observe the solar eclipse. It begins about 10 a.m. Arizona time. And here in Arizona, about two-thirds of the sun will be obscured uh, by the moon. Let's remember you have fellowship with the Almighty who made the sun and the moon and set them in motion and made everything. And you have fellowship with him, and that's more amazing than an eclipse. But even more, through Jesus, we have a fellowship with our believers, our new ministry education center has a large fellowship area. And some of you experienced that last week. We had breakfast in there, and we didn't see the total area of the fellowship. Probably about a third uh, was roped off, not roped off, but screened off. Our fellowship hall will be a little bit different than other fellowship uh, halls and community centers and, and uh, mobile home parks. There's some similarities, of course. But ours goes beyond that, and that we have fellowship with fellow believers. We're connected to one another. And so in church service, in our uh, fellowship hall, you might not know the names of everybody, might not know the names of all the little children, little children might not know the names of grandpas and grandmas, but yet we're connected. We're fellowship with one another through suffering's death and resurrection of Jesus. And this real fact of Christ's resurrection means also that we too shall have a resurrection. We too shall rise. And John writes about this, not only in his epistles, but also in the gospel. He records these words of Jesus. He says, Jesus says, there will be a time when all who are in the graves shall rise and come forth. Because the words of Jesus, who said, because I live, you also shall live. Words of Jesus, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. We leave this earth and go home to heaven. We don't pass out of existence. There have been various false teachings about life after death. We think of life after death, either heaven or hell. 
But there are those who say the false teaching promoted by Satan and his demons that there is no hell. When you hear those words, confront them uh, by saying things such as, says who? Who says there is no hell? You certainly can't find that in the Bible. That's not what God says. And you also can see how this teaching that there is no hell leads to many other false teachings. If there is no hell, from what do you need to be saved? If you don't need to be saved, you don't need a Savior. If you don't need a Savior, you don't need Jesus. If you don't need Jesus, why in the world did he suffer and die as he did? But indeed, there was a hell. It's a fact of life. There's a real hell, and real people end up in hell. Another false teaching which I think is a little bit more common is expressed with the words, we all go to a better place. I think you've probably heard that too. But again, you have to say, says who? Sometimes that statement, we all go to a better place, is said with such a ring of authority that you would think you could find it someplace in the Bible. But it's not there. You know the words of John 3, 16. Well, John 3, 18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. If we all go to a better place, well, why then did Christ suffer and die? And why did he command Christians to go spread the good news to all the world? He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and who does not believe will be condemned. You know his words that he speaks about how it will be on judgment day. He will say to the unbelievers, depart from me into eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. That's a great fact, however, that we shall rise and go to heaven. And doesn't it really amaze you that you're going to live forever? There's something beyond uh, this short 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years of life. There's an eternity ahead. And for you, it's in heaven. The Apostle John, in this letter, began with the thought of eternal life, speaks about it throughout his epistle, and ends it with that thought when he says, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And there are so many things that, with which you are familiar that speak about eternal life. For example, John three sixteen, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The Apostles' Creed, which we're about to say, ends with the thought of how we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. The Lord's Prayer ends up with these words, forever and ever. Psalm 23, last verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's ahead. What eternal life will be like? We're given some uh, information in the scriptures, not necessarily total details, because I think we would not understand everything. It'd be like trying to describe 
to a person blind from birth about the beauties of a sunset, or about the colors in our stained glass windows. Be like trying to describe to a person who's been deaf from birth about the beauties of our Easter hymns, like Jesus Christ has risen today. But we do know something about it. We know this, that we're going to be with our Lord who loves us. And there's nobody who loves us and cares for us more than our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be with him eternally. Someone once said, think of the greatest day of joy in your life. And then multiply that by a thousand times. That'll be like heaven. Listen to some other things that the Lord says. Your body will be raised to life. When we die, our bodies are weakened and, and probably uh, don't look like we ordinary did. Be resurrected. Be like Christ's glorified body. No more aches or pains. No more cancer or migraines. Uh, no more aging. No more arthritis and so on. And then Apostle John wrote in Revelation, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Another thing, we'll be with perfect people. Be no bullying, no annoyances, no insults, no need for locks, but perfect people. Better yet, we will be perfect. No jealousies, no wondering what other people think about us, no worrying, sinful nature done with. And Psalm 16 says, God will fill you with joy in his presence with eternal pleasures at his right hand. A pastor once described the activities in heaven this way. They will be so full of joy, we will not wish we were doing something else. It's no wonder Paul wrote, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. We'll close with two verses of that Easter hymn, and oh, my Redeemer lives. He lives and grants me daily breath. He lives and I shall conquer death. He lives my mansion to prepare. He lives to bring me safely there. He lives all glory to his name. He lives my Jesus still the same. Oh, the sweet joy this sentence gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen.